that was a lot of buttons to press. Uh, hi everyone, I hope you're all well, hope you're enjoying your quarantine, and welcome back to Financial Markets. We have another lecture today, and we will continue talking about uh, limit order book markets, or order-driven markets, as we also called them. Now, uh, I uploaded this slide deck yesterday, and I posted an announcement about it. I realized that I also forgot to press a few buttons that I needed to press, so some of you may have had problems downloading this sl these slides. Uh, so I fixed that a couple hours ago. Uh, so if you had problems, try again, it should work now. I have also re-uploaded the slide deck for the previous week, and the changes there were just... Uh, I cut the content that we did not cover last week, that we will cover this week, namely market design. So as usual, let us start with a refresher of what we did last week. We started talking about limit order book markets, or order-driven markets, and we um, looked at a model um, by Gloston, or a more appropriate way of saying this, we looked at a few simplified models and a few examples that I will collectively refer to as the Gloston's model, but which actually do, do not have that much to do with the model that was originally in the Gloston's paper. Because uh, he had slightly different setup, focused on different questions. Uh, so I am an unreliable narrator in that respect. But I'll refer to those as Gloston's model. And uh, the whole point of this model was to say that if you fix the roles in the market, if you say that, well, there are some traders who always submit market orders, and there are some traders who always submit limit orders, then this latter group, the limit traders, they fulfill the same role that the dealer did in dealer-driven markets. They provide liquidity to the market. Uh, but the way they do it is slightly different because they face different, well, firstly, different incentives, although we did not focus on that aspect. But they focus, they, sorry, they face a different informational environment. Uh, so they are, wh when the dealer knew the whole trade size that was coming in in a given period, limit traders did not have that kind of information and they had to condition their bids on um, less information. So that led to different market outcomes, that led to prices no longer being efficient, that led it, uh, to a positive spread at zero. And that was it. So that's what we did last week. And today we will continue by building upon this, upon Glossin's model. And this may or may not be a slightly shorter lecture. I feel like I have slightly less to say than I usually do, but then you can never guess. So what we will do today is, first, we will look at different aspects of market design. Namely, we, will, um, we have already seen how order-driven markets differ from dealer markets in terms of market outcomes, but there are also a few more dimensions in which uh, order-driven markets can be different from one another. And, uh, well, these are also the dimensions that you can use for regulation or that exchanges can use to regulate trade on their platforms. So, well, namely, you can think of what happens if we put a dealer in the order-driven market, so if we combine the two. But uh, we can also uh, use other instruments to regulate trade meaning we can use different tick sizes, we can use different priority rules, and today we will look at um, how all of these affect uh, trade, affect market environment in the order-driven market. This is the first part of today's lecture, and it will build upon 
the Glostons model uh, for the most part. For the second part of today, we will focus on the actually interesting part of order-driven markets. Uh, we will do what, what I call the dynamic analysis. This is not a very straight line. Uh, we will focus on the question of how do traders choose between submitting a market order versus a limit order? Because so far in Glosson's model, these roles were fixed. These strategies were fixed. But if you think about real markets out there, uh, this choice is something that most traders actually have. This is a decision that they have to make. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And um, let's jump right into that. Market design. Uh, so as I said, there are many dimensions, there are many ways in which legislation or exchange rules can regulate trade. And uh, yeah, the phrase of the day today is unintended consequences. So we will, the main takeaway from today will be that regulation that is seemingly directed at improving liquidity or market depth uh, may quite often backfire by distorting the agent's in incentives. And so attempts to mitigate a particular inefficiency may have far-fetching consequences. So let us start with the question of tick size. So as we discussed last time around, um, in order-driven markets, Prices are often bound to certain ticks. So you can only increase or decrease the price compared to previous order in some discrete increments, tick sizes. By now they are quite often around one cent. Although I, I said that and I realized that I don't actually know about around the world, but I presume that in the, in the US, at New York, I know that it's one cent. I presume that in European exchanges, it's uh, also one euro cent. But this was all not always like this. So at New York before 1997, the tick size was one eighth of a dollar. And that's quite a big difference. So instead of reading all this slide, let us go to the graphs and let us investigate this issue graphically. So let me, uh, once again, we will focus on just one side of the market. And let me draw what we had um, as a representation of our supply curve generated by uh, the limit order book. So on the ask side of the market, you have um, this line and I will now use my horrible handwriting to say that it was our expected value of the fundamental conditional on uh, trade size Q. Let me try it again. Trade size Q, not much better. Um, this will also be trade size Y. So this was conditional on Total trade size uh, Q. I realize we had quite a bit of inconsistency in how we called all this. Um, sorry, Q being greater than YK, where Y um, was a position in the limit order book of a given trader. So once again, what this curve represents is if we take this limit trader here, so he is he offers the, I don't know, the 15th, if this is zero and this is 15, this trader offers the 15th best bid in the limit order book. So conditional on his trade being executed, on him uh, actually succeeding in selling his asset. What does he know? He knows that the total order size was for at least 15 units. So the expected value of the fundamental 
conditional on this is given by exactly this line. It's given by the expected value of phi conditional on total uh, trade size Q being greater than 15. And uh, in a competitive market with continuous ticks, this was exactly the price that uh, this limit trader would set. Because he must get zero profit, and uh, by setting this price, he gets zero profit. Let me erase that. Uh, and, well, that focuses on the on adverse selection side of things. You can also think that there is the second term, uh, the display cost C, the cost of submitting the limit order to the market, divided by the probability, let me just write P, of Q being greater or equal than Y. Uh, let's see, let me see if I can move it. Oh, this is slow. Perfect. And just to fill in the void that was left by this. Yeah. Okay, going back, this was probability of receiving an order size of at least Q. So this is the zero profit line for the uh, limit traders. And once again, this corresponds to the price that would be set for any given unit Q in the limit order book if tick sizes um, are absent. So if um, prices can be set continuously. Now, what happens if we have discrete ticks? Limit traders will submit their orders up until uh, the zero profit point. So they will submit orders as long as it yields them positive profits. And say our ticks are like this. So these are the three lowest ticks available above well, this um, intersection point. And assume also that we have time priority meaning that limit order book works on a first come first serve basis, meaning among all limit orders that have the same price, those that were submitted earlier uh, get the priority, so they are executed first. And okay, let me also write that this is A1, this is A2, this was A3, all the possible ask prices uh, in the notation that we had last week. So, what happens uh, if the limit order book is empty? So the well, traders will submit some uh, orders. No, let's not start with an empty one. The first order at this price A1 will get this margin profit. So if this is one. I'm not drawing anything to scale. They'll get this much in profit. They'll get the difference between the price that they set and the, well, the true fair valuation of the asset, right? So they'll get positive profit. The second limit uh, order at price A1 will get this much. The third one will get this much and so on. So traders will submit limit orders as long as they generate non-negative profits meaning up until this point. At this point, the trader gets zero profit, meaning that there will be no further limit orders beyond this point at price A1. But there will be at price A2. And at price A2, once again, the first limit order will receive this much in profit, second one will receive this much in profit, and so on. So we will have limit orders at price A2 up until this point and continue to A3, this point, and so on. So I, I believe that I also drew this picture last week. 
maybe on Friday, maybe on Wednesday. So it should look somewhat familiar. Now, why do we need it here? Why do we need it today? What is the profit of the limit traders in this market with this tick size? The total profit of all limit traders is given by the area of all these green triangles, right? Maybe if I have a thicker paintbrush. Fabulous. So this is the profit of limit traders in this market, right? Okay, hold that thought. Now, what happens if we reduce the tick size? If prices are now being able to, um, are now able to be set at finer increments. And just to have a nice picture, let's say that this is um, still our A1. A2 will be here, the new one. This will be now A3. Not good. A4. Wait, what did I do? A4. Well, you get the idea. This will be A5. Why? Why does it? Why does it move? Picture is moving. I don't know why. I should not be able to move it. So, what will happen when we have these new uh, red ticks? Let us try to see what. Um, how will the limit order book look like? How the real supply curve generated by the limit order book will look like? It was blue with pre with the old ticks, and now it will be so still like this at A1. At A2, we'll have this much. At A3, we'll have this much. Then at A4, up until this point. At A5, up until this point. And the profits of limit traders in this market will be given by this plus this plus this so by sum of all the areas between the red uh, line and the black line geometrically speaking so what is the conclusion that we make the conclusion is, once we uh, made these tick sizes finer, the total profit of limit traders in this market has decreased, right? We are now missing... Uh, let, do, do, do. The, traders, the limit traders are no longer getting this area in profits. They are no longer getting this area in profits. So average profit of limit traders in the market has decreased. And while we are not modeling um, anything explicitly, what this might mean is that we will have fewer limit traders in the market. If they have some fixed costs of participation, uh, they will participate less actively. So the finer is the tick size, uh, the less depth we might actually have in the market. Again, not part of the model, but a very broad intuition. So going back to the slides, uh, this is basically what's written in this slide that we didn't cover. So decreasing tick size may drive away limit traders and reduce depth. And well, it will also reduce spread by design if your original spread was... Uh... No, sorry. It will reduce spread by a, a fraction of a decrease in tick size. Uh... I want to say something like this. So it will not be a very significant in decrease in spread. It will be a decrease in spread due to that uh, arises due to the rounding errors. So the rounding error will be smaller when we round try again 
What? Oh, no, sorry. Wrong buttons. Uh, I'm talking about the rounding error between this minimal price at which the limit traders are willing to trade, to trade the first unit of the asset, and this lowest tick that actually happens. So the way I drew this curve, uh, these ticks coincide, but in reality, well, A1 will probably be a little lower. So you'll have a lower lowest ask price. And similarly, the higher highest bid price. So the spread will be somewhat uh, smaller. But depth will also be smaller the way we think about it. So peculiar feature about this is this is probably the first time we are encountering these two effects simultaneously. So, so far, liquidity and depth were largely um, synonyms. If you increase liquidity, you increase depth and vice versa. So this is kind of the first time around where we increase liquidity by reducing spread, if that's the measure you want to take, but uh, we decrease depth. Yes, another, uh, another effect of driving out limit traders, uh, in, again in dynamics, so not part of the model that we've seen, is that the limit order book will be replenished more slowly after trades. So the fewer limit traders you have, the less actively they are submitting orders. So not only you have thinner book at any given point in time, but it also recovers uh, more slowly once trades happen. And uh, this is a property of a market that we call resiliency. The ability to um, replenish liquidity that was uh, exhausted by previous trades. And uh, so the conclusions of our musings, I don't want, I don't even want to say model analysis because we did not stick to the model that closely. Uh, we can test these conclusions or not we, but there were people who tested these conclusions. So they tested one of those um, cases at New York Stock Exchange when in 1997 they changed tick size from one eighth to one sixteenth of a dollar. And what they found was pretty much what we just described. So for small orders, the trading costs decreased, which aligns with what we said about smaller spread or slightly smaller spread at least. But for large orders, trading costs, uh, did not decrease. I guess it's unclear. So they might have decreased for some, they might have increased for others. But the claim that I want to make is that this corresponds to this higher liquidity being offset by smaller depth. So decreasing the tick size has improved liquidity a little bit, has decreased trading costs for small orders but it also drove some limit traders out of the market and um, um, which resulted in lower depth which resulted in offset of this trading cost savings uh, for large orders so this aligns with our predictions and these are effects of uh, tick size now there is another way to look at it to look at the effects of tick size and um, to do that, I want to go back to last week where I gave you this open-ended question that we never answered. So suppose that there is no tick. Quotes can be placed on a continuous price space. And suppose that there is price priority, so as, as a first order uh, priority in the market. What is then the role of time priority? So that first come quotes at identical prices are served first. And I will answer this with a quote by um, one Manu Inaran from something, some article called HFT 101. 
and you can guess where it goes. Uh, and he said, the size of the trading increment is a powerful level that is underappreciated by regulators. The finer the trading increment, the more important price priority becomes relative to time priority. In other words, if the market was designed to trade at continuous non-penny increments, you could always win a trade by quoting the best price and the speed game would be non-existent. So once again, going back sorry, to our pictures, recall that we have assumed that there is time priority in the market. So the first trader who submits a limit uh, order at a given price is the first order to be executed at that price. So what's the premium from being the first? In the large stick size world, the blue world, uh, we had this much profit to be reaped from being the first trader to submit a limit order at a given price, right? So it was really beneficial. In the red world with lower tick size, our profit is lower. It's twice as much with, it's twice as small with uh, when the tick size is twice as small. So broadly speaking, the Lower, the smaller the tick size, the more important is price priority relative to time priority. And uh, tick size in general can be used to balance price priority against time priority. So among other effects that decreasing tick size can have on the market, uh, we have that if you decrease the tick size, the time priority becomes less important. So you may drive out the limit traders who were consistently among the first ones. You will drive out the speedy limit traders, the, the high frequency traders, uh, and all the algorithmic traders. Uh, you will drive those out. So it might be the case that you will attract some of the slower limit traders who never get to be the first but now because they face less competition from algorithmic traders they might get get a chance to reap larger profits so this might might actually happen i don't know of any works that tested this but uh, you can think that decreasing tick size will uh, drive out algorithmic traders and attract a few of the um, slow traders. Now we will talk about high frequency trading in more detail in one of the coming weeks. I can't remember when exactly, but we will do that. So let's not stop here with a great excruciating amount of detail, but rather move on. And let us consider another dimension of um, market design. Or maybe it's not as different since we already started talking about priority rules. So now, so far, we have assumed that uh, orders are executed based on price as a first priority and based on time for arrival as a second priority. This is not the only option that you can have in the market. In particular, an alternative to time priority is a pro rata allocation. And what it means is that if you have, say, if you have many limit orders at a given price in a market, and then a market order arrives that fulfills only a share of that total depth at a given price level, then all limit orders at that price level are executed uh, to some extent. They are executed proportionally. So to, to just make sure, uh, quick example, pro rata allocation example. Suppose that at price, I don't know, A equal to 100, you have two limit orders. You have limit order 
uh, for limit order to sell for 400 units and another limit order to sell for 600 units so your total depth for the um your total not total market depth but market depth at price level of 100 is a thousand units and um let's say this this is the best ask available so then a market order to buy arrives and it is for let's say 500 units what happens then what when happens what happens when it's when it arrives um it is fulfilled of course and it is fulfilled by uh, 200 units from the first limit trader the trader who submitted this limit order and by 300 units from the second limit trader so all limit orders at a given price are uh, are used proportionally when a given market order arrives okay so what happens when we substitute time priority in a given market by pro rata allocation now let us go back to the graphs or wonderful wonderful graphs let's draw a new one but it will be more or less the same graph once again once again so with competitive um, with competitive limit traders once again th this is the same line that we had in the previous graph in here I will not write all this again because it will take 20 minutes. In a competitive market with pro rata allocation, the last limit trader to submit an order at a given tick, we still have tick sizes, or we still have ticks in the market, the last limit trader to submit a limit order at a given tick must obtain zero profit. That's the property of competitive markets. But um, with pro rata allocation, profit of all traders from uh, of all profit of all traders at a given tick is the same because they are treated equally, meaning that profit of all traders at a given market will be equal to zero meaning that what we will have will look something like this our aggregate supply curve in the market will look like this so these are the ticks and why will it look like this because at this tick a1 why does it move it should not move i i do not understand but at this price level A1, the, all limit traders at this price level get a total profit equal to this area, because for these first units, um, for these first units traded, they do not. The price they get A1 is above the expected value of the fundamental condition on trade, while for these units they have a loss equal to this area because here the expected value of the fundamental is above the price that they pay so these two areas must be exactly the same so that all traders get zero profit in aggregate and each individual trader what this means in particular is that you will have greater depth at a1 but if you look Carefully, it does not necessarily mean that you will have great... Well, no, no, sorry. 
you will have greater depth at any given um, tick. So at A1 it will be this instead of this. At A2 it will be this much instead of this much. So that's the cumulative depth. It will be Y1, uh, let's say, pro rata. This was Y1. Uh, price priority. Let's just call it Y1 without any index. This was Y2. This is the new Y2. So, the takeaway. If you substitute price priority, sorry, time priority by pro rata allocation, then you will obtain greater depth in the market. But it will once again come at a cost of decreasing profits of the limit traders. So they had positive profits under price priority. They will all get zero profits under pro rata allocation, meaning that, well, you will once again drive out, drive some limit traders out of the market. And this greater depth effect may be completely offset by driving out uh, limit traders out of the market. That said, pro rata allocation is actually used in some markets. And two examples given in the book are electronic futures market for the leading short-term interest rate and the market for two-year U.S. Treasuries. So, presumably it is better in those markets. Or maybe exchange designers did not optimize. We'll never know, I guess. Unless you want to write a paper about it. Then I don't know how this paper would look like. So that concludes our discussion about priority rules. But does not yet conclude our discussion of um, market design, because one last aspect that I want to talk to you about is about hybrid markets. So it relates to the very first question that we asked. What if we take the dealer and we put him into the order-driven market? The dealer will provide more liquidity, so overall liquidity in the market should increase, right? Wrong, of course. Because limit order, limit traders will adapt their behavior to dealer's presence. They will change the way they trade and this might completely offset um, the benefits of adding a dealer. And to see this, let us look at a very simple example. Let us once again try to put the dealer into the Gloston model that we had. And the dealer will be like the one we had in Kyle's model. So the dealer can observe the total trade size whenever a market order arrives, and the dealer can offer a price improvement compared to limit order book for this given trader. So the timing in, uh, in such a market would be This. Or maybe actually this timing in a hybrid market will look as follows. First, limit traders submit their orders to the limit order book. Then a market order arrives of some given size Q, dealer observes the market order, in particular the dealer observes the market order size, uh, this Q, and can offer, sorry, can execute it at, well, at some price. 
which is better than what the limit order book offers for this order size. So the dealer cannot force market orders uh, against his unappealing price, but the dealer can offer price improvement to the market order. So what will happen in this case? Um, should I go to the slides? Should I go to the graph? Let's go to the graph. And let us use our previous graph. Can I go? No, okay, this will take us too far back. Sorry. So let us let us think about well red ticks. Market with red ticks with price priority. So we talked about pro rata allocations and now we forgot all about it. We are going back to time priority world. And now we have a dealer here. So how will the dealer act? Now the limit um, the limit traders, as we discussed last time, they profit off small orders and they lose on the large orders. So to see this, let us, for example, consider a trader somewhere. Now, if I just find some color that's not yet present in this picture, let us take... No, let's take this trader. who is at this position in the limit order book. Now, if trade size is very small, so below this amount, then this trader's order is not executed, or his profit is zero. Or I guess his profit is slightly negative due to the display cost C. If the order size is In this area, so between, um, so the so the dealer's order is executed at price A2. Sorry, not the deal of the limit traders, at price A2. But the fundamental value of the asset expected, conditional on the total trade size, will be below. Um, Oh, that's actually not even the right line to compare it to. So we should have... Sorry about that. I have not drawn these graphs in advance for myself. Uh... And... Yeah, sorry, let me just try to fix it really quickly. And, okay. So given that the order executes at price A2, this trader that we're looking at will profit as long as total order size is in this whole interval. So between the solid pink line and this dashed pink line. Because the expected value of the fundamental conditional order size will be below uh, price A2 below the price below the price that the trader actually gets. While for large trades, for those above this pink dashed line, the expected value of the fundamental will be above A2, so our limit trader will lose. Once again, this was to illustrate that limit traders benefit of or profit of small trades, and they lose on large trades. So this was a refresher. Now, what if we have a dealer in this market? What can the dealer actually do? The dealer observes the total size of the incoming market order. So the dealer, to break even, needs to uh, offer a price that's above this black line. But he can offer some price strictly above the black line to get a profit. And he can... Uh, improve on the prices quoted by the limit order book. For example, for this order size here, 
the trade at which limit order book will be ready to execute this will be somewhere between A1 and A2. So it will be some units at A1, some units at A2. So let's say the price will be this for the limit order book. And you can see that there is scope for dealer to profit. So if dealer quotes any price in this green cucumber between this uh, black zero profit line and this pink average price line, the dealer will quote a better price and will break a profit at the same time. So the moral of the story here is that the dealer can pick off the profitable limit orders and will only uh, relay the unprofitable ones back to the limit order book, the large ones. Now I had an example here that is based on example one from previous lecture where we had informed market traders and noise market traders that uh, bought or sold small or large quantity with equal probabilities. Uh, I do not think I will be going through it today because I'm going much slower than I expected to. But uh, you can look at this example if you did not understand my musings in the past 10 minutes. Hopefully this example will clear things up. So the moral here is that if we add the dealer to the market, the dealer will pick off the profitable limit trades. So limit traders will be once again driven out of the market. They will be less eager to submit limit trades to the market, uh, limit orders. And so liquidity provided by the dealer will crowd out the liquidity provided by uh, limit traders in the market. So that's one side of the story. Many markets still combine dealers uh, and order-driven markets, despite what we just said. You think, why is that? Well, one way to see is, is that what we just saw, the effect of adding a dealer to the market, only has an adverse effect on the limit order book when the limit order book does actually exist, when it's uh, deep, when it's full, when, they, when there would have been a lot of limit orders without a dealer. Putting a dealer kind of decreases them. So the one way to phrase it is that adding a dealer to the market decreases market liquidity and depth. Here I'm back once again to using these two terms syn synonymically. It decreases liquidity and depth in good times. Meaning when there is a lot of liquidity in the market or where, when there would have been a lot of liquidity in the market. But in bad times, when limit order book is pretty much non-existent or it offers a huge spread. So just all in all, limit order book does not provide a lot of liquidity. Uh, the adverse effect on the limit order book from adding a dealer is non-negligible. Sorry, is negligible, is non-significant. So there is not much liquidity to destroy in the limit order book because there is not much liquidity there to start with in the first place. So in that case, adding a dealer would improve liquidity. And there is one story in the textbook that tells you, uh, you know, there was a case when exactly that happened. There was some period of high volatility and liquidity in limit order book dried out, but uh, dealers kind of took it upon themselves to trade, uh, to, to provide liquidity. So all in all, adding a dealer to an order driven market decreases liquidity in good times, but it can increase liquidity in bad times. So you can think of this as a kind of a liquidity insurance for the market. It smooths the volatility of liquidity in the market. So adding a dealer might actually be a good idea. Okay, we are a little overdue for a break, but We'll probably do a slightly shorter break. So let us take 
a five minute break starting now and we'll be back in five minutes.